All right, if we could turn, please, to the book of Judges once again. We're in chapter 18, and I want to read from verse 27. I'm going to read into chapter 19 down to verse 10. Our theme this morning basically is going to be a rival place, uh, the setting up of a rival place to <clears throat> worship a false idol rather than worshiping the Lord. And so verse 27, it says, they took the things which Micah had made and the priest which he had and came unto Laish, unto a people that were at quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon and they had no business with any man. And it was in the valley that lieth by Beth Rehob and they built a city and dwelt therein. And they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan their father who was born unto Israel. Howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days, so they did eat and drink and lodge there. And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose in the morning, that he arose up to depart, and the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterwards go your way. So they sat down and did eat and drink, both of them together, for the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him. Therefore he lodged there again. And he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until afternoon, and they did eat, both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening. I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here, that thine heart may be merry. And tomorrow get ye early on your way, that thou mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. And again, God will bless the reading of his precious word to us this morning. So we're still on the story of Micah and his idols, and we're kind of coming to a climax. And how uh, we read there in verse 27, it says, they took the things which Micah had made and the priest which he had, and came unto Laish to a people that were at quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. And as we saw last time, Micah, who had felt like God was going to bless him because not only did he have a house full of idols, but he now had uh, a Levite as his priest. But uh, it turned out not to be such a blessing after all. In fact, he ended up with absolutely nothing. And of course, yeah, his... Uh, Levite and all his idols were taken by the tribe of Dan 
And so they go to their new location. Remember, they were seeking out a place, an easy place, because the place uh, where they had been allotted by God was too difficult for them. And so they wanted to find something easier. They didn't like the fight. And so they wanted an easier place. And so they come to this place called Laish. They find a people there that were quiet and secure. And it says they smote them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. And again, just a, it's a tragic picture in a sense for the people of Laish. Uh, here they are, quiet and secure, but it's a deceptive quietness and a deceptive security because while they're going about their business, they have no idea that judgment is about to fall upon them and they're all going to be slaughtered, uh, the slaughtering of the people of Laish, and everything they have is going to be burned to the ground. And I can't help but think that in our world today there are people the judgment of god is drawing near uh, the coming of christ and what that will will happen after the church is gone the tribulation judgments and then ultimately an eternity in the lake of fire and there are people uh, feel like they're quiet and secure there's uh, people that are uh, just subtly deceived by the evil one and and i think amusement plays a huge part in that. As long as they can keep watching their soaps or their latest dramas on TV, it's like all is well. And they're duped, and yet judgment is about to fall. And certainly the people of Laish remind us of that. And verse 28 says, and there was no deliverer. Tragically, um, they uh, they refuse to listen to it they they again they don't want to be troubled they like their ease and quiet and yet there is a deliverer and we have a strong responsibility don't we and as we draw to the end of the end of the age to warn them uh, to to compel them to come in and oh how we we need uh, the lord to stir our hearts because there's a people that are quiet and secure but judgment is ready to pounce and there is a deliverer, and we can introduce them to that deliverer. But here there was no deliverer. And part of it was because of their geographical location. They were far from uh, from Zidon. Uh, and so the, the nearest people that could come to rescue them were a good distance. Uh, they had no business with any man, so they're isolated. And they're in this place, this valley, uh, lying between two mountain ranges. So it's a very isolated spot, perfect for the tribe of Dan. They want an easy place. And so this place that there's nobody to defend them, it's just, it seems to be a very easy place for them. So they come in, they slaughter them, and they build the city uh, for themselves now, the tribe of Dan. And again, remember, it's not the whole tribe. Uh, it was only 600 warriors and their wives and children. Uh, others stayed in their allotted area like Samson. He's going to be uh, down the pike quite considerably after this incident. This is early on in the book of Judges. But the tribe of Dan, part of them go up to this area and they build this city. Uh, and they, it says in verse 29, they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born unto Israel. Howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. So what they tried to do was eradicate its past. And so they called the name, they renamed the city. It's, it's kind of wiping out the past, the past history. It's, and it's now Dan. But the author reminds us, and perhaps underlining their disobedience, that actually it was really Laish from the very beginning. And uh, it's not where God wanted them to be. It was not the place that they were intended to be. But it is significant because the city of Dan will become the most prominent northern city in Israel. And so it will give uh, rise to the phrase from Dan to Beersheba, which we see uh, on a number of occasions in the scriptures. In fact, in chapter 20 of Judges, you'll see then all the children of Israel went out and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. Uh, we see it again if you look at 1 Samuel in chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 20, where we'll see this phrase from Dan to Beersheba once again. 
1 Samuel 3, uh, verse 20, and all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And so it, it came to be a term that really, speaking of the land of Israel from its northern extremity in Dan to its southern extremity in Beersheba. And so it's given us that sense of the whole expression, meaning uh, kind of the whole of the nation, uh, kind of covering its whole geographical region. So having uh, renamed the city uh, after their father, Dan, it says the children of Dan set up the graven image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. So they, they set up this graven image. Now, we want to, we'll focus more on that in a moment, but I want you just to notice too that this is now we find out who this Levite was. Uh, they said the first time we get his name, uh, his name is Jonathan. He's uh, the son of Gershom. And then it says the son of Manasseh. And I think we mentioned in the Q&A last time uh, that there is a textual uh, question here. Um, the Hebrew text um, has inserted a superlinear letter N uh, in the name of Moses. So Mose, and they've got an N there, and, and they take it to read Manasseh. And some believe it was a, a, a pious scribe attempting to relieve Moses' grandson, Jonathan, of involvement with idolatry. They're trying to protect Moses, you see, and his, his dynasty, his grandson, is this person. Now, whether that's correct or not, I tend to uh, be of those that are persuaded not to believe higher criticism. Uh, I tend to believe that the Textus Receptus is the correct text, and uh, I'm not impressed with, with higher critics uh, who, in my mind, are the modern-day Sadducees. They don't believe in the supernatural, and they want to eradicate uh, certain things and so anyway I, i'm not going to go there but that's just my personal conviction uh, and and so i tend to believe that the issue is not so much that it's moses grandson the real issue is that he's a levite and whatever his lineage is it doesn't make any difference he's a levite and who were the levites let's look back at exodus 32 exodus 32 remember the golden calf uh, when Moses came down the mountain and he found that they had made this golden calf and were worshiping it. Well, a question is asked in verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and he said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from the gate to gate through the camp and slay every man, his brother and every man, his companion, every man, his neighbor. The children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3000 men. For Moses had said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And so the tribe of Levi were known for their loyalty to the Lord and to Moses. Who is on the Lord's side? And the tribe of Levi said, we are. And so that's why this is so utterly distasteful that this man, Jonathan, whatever his heritage, the bottom line is that he was not on the Lord's side he was on the side of the highest bidder. Whoever would give him the most money, he would serve them, <laughs> not the Lord. You cannot serve God and mammon. It's just not possible. But this guy, his money is what motivates. Money and position and place, these things are what motivates. Rather than the Lord, rather than the honor of the Lord. And so this man, this man, Jonathan, he sold his soul basically to the highest bidder. And it tells us that actually it would have implications for his offspring. 
it says he set up the graven image and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And there's some debate. Is this till the Assyrian captivity or is this to the time when the Philistines took the ark and defeated Israel? Uh, and there's some discussion because if it is uh, the captivity, Assyrian captivity, then it's a word of prophecy in a sense. It's saying that this, this rebellious tribe would continue that way right up to the time of the Assyrian captivity. And so notice it says um, that they set them up, Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. And so here's really the main point of this passage is they set up a rival place of worship to the one place that God had intended to place his name there and for the people to go to. He set up a, a, a rival place based on, again, that which God had clearly prohibited. He said, you shall not make for yourself any graven image. And so now they're worshiping rather than the living God, who has revealed his glory to them, and, and that place is close by at Shiloh, they are now uh, have a rival place, but it's with a wicked idol that has been set up uh, by Micah, made by Micah, basically through his stolen money that had he'd stolen from his mother. So I want us to just look for a moment at Deuteronomy chapter 12. It's just it's kind of an interesting thing when you're preaching from different places. I was preaching uh, in the book of Acts uh, this last Lord's Day, chapter 11, and we were talking uh, in that message about how uh, this New Testament era, uh, there, were, there were dispensational changes that were taking place. And one of them was that the one place which was where God had chosen to place his name, which was Jerusalem, now was changing just in the in the words of the prophecy of the Lord Jesus, where he said it's not going to be in this mountain or, or in Jerusalem where God is worshipped, but it's, it's going to be wherever people are gathered together, uh, <clears throat> worshipping the Father in spirit and truth. And certainly the one place in the New Testament is where the Lord has chosen to place his name, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. But in the Old Testament, there was a one place. And that one place was in one geographical location. And Deuteronomy 12 brings this out very, very clearly. So I want us to, to do quite a bit of reading here in Deuteronomy 12, because I think it's very, very significant. So let's just, uh, we'll begin in verse 3. Uh, <clears throat> well, verse 2. You shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which you shall possess served their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars, break their pillars, burn their groves with fire, and you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. You shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall you seek, and neither thou and thither shalt thou come. And thither you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks and there you shall eat before the lord your god and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto ye and your households wherein the lord thy god hath blessed thee now i want you to notice carefully verse eight it says you shall not do after all the things that we do here this day every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes does that remind you of anything isn't that the the key kind of phrase in chapter 18 through 21 that they did that which was right in their own eyes every man did that which is right in, the, in their own eyes and so he's telling you no that you you can't do what's right in your own eyes you must go to this one place this one place where the lord has chosen to place his name there and that is where you're to go to bring your 
offerings to do what God has commanded you to do. Uh, just look again. We won't go into a lot more reading, but just to see the overall theme here. Verse 11. Then there, there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Verse 11. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice vows which you vow to the Lord. Verse 14, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings. Uh, verse 18, but thou must eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Verse 21, the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to put his name there be too far from thee, then thou shalt kill of thy herd and thy flock. And this is personal things. This is not worship because it goes on. It says, verse 26, only the, thy holy things which thou hast in thy vows, thou shalt take and go into the place which the Lord shall choose. And so the overwhelming message of Deuteronomy chapter 12 the, the second law that was given to this generation uh, that had uh, been too young uh, when they had come to Kadesh Barnea, uh, had survived the, uh, the death of those in the wilderness and were now getting ready to go into the land themselves. And he repeats the law to them. And one of the things he says is, when you go into the land, destroy all their idle places, destroy all their graven images, and you shall resort to that one place where the Lord has chosen to place his name there. And so the tragedy of Judges chapter 18 is that the tribe of Dan have now, doing that which was right in their own eyes, have set up a rival place. Not only have they set up a rival place, but this rival place is is not even trying to be like the true and living God. It actually has a graven image as the center and object of worship. And this is the tragedy of the tribe of Dan. And, it, and, and so verse 31, the emphasis here is this. Not only did they set up Micah's graven, graven image, which he made all the time. It says this, all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. Not too far away. The house of God is there in Shiloh. And they, instead of resorting to the, the house of God, that God had set up a place he had chosen to place his name, instead, they resorted to this graven image that Micah had set up. The interesting thing is that although the Danites went there, Shiloh was still there. And Boaz and Elkanah and Hannah would resort there. The Book of Judges. Remember, the Book of Judges is followed by the Book of Ruth, but it's the same time frame. And even though we, we know from the Book of Judges, the house of God was not in good, uh, sorry, the Book of Ruth, the house of God was not in good state at that time. And yet, nevertheless, nevertheless, that is where uh, there was uh, uh, resorting to the house of God. And so, this system, it professes to, to give Jehovah a place, but is essentially idolatrous. And yet there's a parallel system that God set up close by. And the false worship of Dan was a forerunner, really, of that of Jeroboam I, who later established the Northern Kingdom Shrine. And he, he built two shrines, two because he didn't want people to go to the one place. So where did he build them? Well, one was in Dan, wasn't it? And the other was in Bethel. And he set up two places, rival places. First Kings, if you look there, please, just for a second, just to see this. The implications here, the things that are started here, uh, they're, they're going to have uh, implications for years to come. First Kings in chapter 12 and verse 28 it says, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other put he in Dan. 
and the thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan, because <laughs> they'd already got used to the idea that that was a rival place. And so they went to the one in Dan, and he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And so basically, uh, this is the beginning of established idolatry in Israel, in the very land of promise. It began with individual idolatry in Israel with the likes of Micah, but it has now become official idolatry of a whole tribe. Through a, a strange chain of events, begins with a son stealing 1,100 shekels from his mother. It ends with an entire tribe led into established idolatry and stealing from God the glory that alone is due to his name. And so you see the awesome consequence of choice. Like Micah's household, did they, did, at the time when they did what they did, did they realize the, the long-term implications of their idolatrous act, that it would actually affect the nation in days to come? And so we have to be conscious of the importance of choice and choices we make. And the ramifications, they may not seem that big at the time, but they can have huge consequences. So they set this carved image up. So far reaching, Micah's little idol became a, a, a rival center of worship to the house of God in Shiloh. And so this is the tragedy. A man-made God became the center of the people's worship at the very same time that the Lord was dwelling in the midst of his people in the tabernacle at Shiloh. I want you to just look at Romans chapter 1. Actually, we're going to be, if you have a Bible marker, you might want to put it in Romans chapter 1 because we're going to see a lot of parallels between these last chapters of Judges in Romans chapter 1. I was talking to a brother recently. We were discussing Romans 1. And the traditional view of Romans 1 is that, you know, kind of you, you've got the world on trial. It starts with the pagan world in chapter 1. It goes on to uh, the religious world in chapter two, uh, the moral the moral man in chapter 2, and then the religious man in chapter 3. But I am beginning to question that. I am beginning to come to the conclusion that Romans 1 is about Israel. And what God is doing is he's taking a batch sample of the human race, a very privileged batch sample, Israel, and he's showing that if the batch sample is wrong, everything's wrong. In other words, if you're a quality controller, you work in a factory, and you're involved in quality control, you don't check every piece that is manufactured, you pull a batch out, you check the batch. If the batch is good, the assumption is the whole is good. If the batch is defective, you assume the whole is defective. God has picked a batch called Israel, and by this nation, he is showing that the whole is corrupt. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, look at Romans 1 verse 21. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Well, I may suggest to you that the only nation that saw the glory of God and made a deliberate exchange was Israel. His glory was revealed to them. And let me just show you a couple of scriptures. Psalm 106, just for a second. Psalm 106, verse 20. I just want to look at a couple of scriptures that illustrate this. Psalm 106, verse 20 Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox 
that eateth grass. Who, who did this? Who changed their glory into the similitude of an ox? Psalm 106 is talking about Israel. Well, back at verse 9, he rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. Uh, verse 10, he saved them from the hand of them that hated them, redeemed them from the hand. This is a redeemed people. This Psalm 106 is, is reiterating the nation of Israel's history and all that they saw and all the blessings they had. And to this people, he says, they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox. <laughs> it's Israel. And we could look at other scriptures. Look at Jeremiah 2, please. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. Jeremiah 2, 11, it says, Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Who exchanged the glory of God? <laughs> Who was it that took it, made an exchange and instead of worshiping God, who had revealed himself in all his glory to them, and instead they worshipped idols? Who was that? Well, it was Israel. They, they were that guilty nation. Uh, the book of Ezekiel and uh, chapter 8. And because Ezekiel is the prophet of the glory of God, and he talks about the glory revealed, and then he talks about the glory being removed from Israel. And then ultimately, he talks about the glory of being restored to Israel in the latter days. But in Ezekiel 8, verse 10, again, it says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, uh, sorry, what am I looking at here? Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, go in, behold, he said to me, verse 9, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Now, this is, this is, Ezekiel is going into the house of God, to the temple itself. And God is showing him why he can't stay there anymore and why his glory must depart. And he's showing him the reason. And actually in the house of God itself, they have got creeping things, abominable beasts, and all the idols actually in the house of God, portrayed in the very house of God. And so God says, I can't stay here anymore. I, I can't, I will not share my glory with anyone. And I certainly am not going to share it with these graven images. I'm leaving. And so we see the glory of God slowly leaving. And so here's, here's the tragedy that this very chapter that we're studying, Judges 18, is the beginning of Israel making that exchange, changing the glory of God and worshiping idols. And it's tragic, tragic for the nation, tragic for the tribe of Dan, because when you get to the book of Revelation, and you get the 144,000 sealed witnesses that God is going to choose, you'll notice that there's a tribe significant by their absence, the tribe of Dan. Not there, not listed amongst those that will be loyal to the Lord in the day of tribulation. In fact, some believe that this treacherous tribe, the tribe of Dan, the very man of sin himself will be from the tribe of Dan. I can't dogmatically state that, but it wouldn't surprise me. They're the idolatrous tribe, and certainly they're not mentioned in the book of Revelation. However, grace triumphs in the end. Where sin abounds, grace does yet more abound. When we get to the book of Ezekiel, Again, chapter 48, and we get the, the land being apportioned again to the tribes. It's interesting that there's, there's no land on the other side, Jordan. The two and a half tribes are not going to be on the other side, Jordan. They're all going to be on, on the, in the land that God originally promised to his people. But you have a listing in Ezekiel 48, and it says in verse 1, now these are the names of the tribes. From the north end to the coast of the way of 
Hethlon, as one goes to Hamath, Hazarenan, the border of Damascus, northward to the coast of Hamath. For these are his sides, east and west, a portion for Dan. <laughs> and so Dan will be in the millennial kingdom. Now he's going to be not where he was initially apportioned, right? Not uh, down in the south uh, <laughs> on the Mediterranean coast, but way up in the north where they migrated in this chapter uh, up by Laish. They're going to be the furthest north. And again, the furthest away from the presence of God in Jerusalem. Kind of interesting. But nevertheless, they're going to be there in the millennial kingdom. And so God's grace ultimately triumphs for the tribe of Dan, who were the first tribe to institute idolatry in the nation of Israel. And so again, for ourselves, we, we need to recognize that in this church age, uh, remember the Lord said, uh, it's not going to be in Jerusalem now, uh, but it's where people uh, meet to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And as we read in Matthew 18, it's where, where two or three are gathered in his name. There he is in the midst. That's the place that we're to meet onto his name. And we do not want to be sidetracked to other things that are manufactured by man as a substitute for the place where God has chosen to place his name. So again, there's a challenge there for us uh, and an encouragement to us as well to be faithful to the Lord uh, in these days of departure and not be like the tribe of Dan were. And yet still we see grace in the tribe of Dan. Well, let's move into chapter 19 now. But there's a great connection. Even though these incidents are not directly related, in other words, it's not the same people that are involved, they are indirectly related. It's a very deeply disturbing chapter, and it's about moral depravity of the worst kind. And there's a, the connection is simply this, that the moment we reject the God of revelation, when there's spiritual adultery, it will be followed very quickly with moral depravity. A wrong view of God will lead to a wrong way of living, okay? <laughs> right theology understood, believed, and acted upon will lead to right living. Wrong concepts of God will ultimately lead to failure and particularly moral failure of the highest kind. And so there's a definite connection between these, these uh, chapters, uh, an indirect connection, but a connection nevertheless and it's a deeply disturbing chapter it's one that we'd love to skip you know we'd love to just go on to chapter 20 in fact fb mayer uh who famous preacher of a former generation yeah he 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 said he recommended not reading it that was his recommendation i recommend you don't even read it he says, uh, it will be sufficient to ponder the opening verse. It came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. Stop there. Don't read anymore. <laughs> That's what he would like us to do. And, and uh, you can understand because what he says is, uh, if we just think about in those days, there's no king in Israel. We meditate on that. It's mentioned four times in the book without reading any further in this terrible chapter. It simply shows the depths of the depravity to which we may sink apart from the grace of God. And by the way, it's true, isn't it? What depths of depravity we can sink to when we begin to do that which is right in our own eyes and we refuse to submit ourselves to Christ as King. Now, of course, we often say Lord, the Lord of our lives, and, and that's correct. But in this context here, when it says they're no king in Israel, they wouldn't have him to be king over their lives. And they made themselves king, their reasoning, their thinking. And that's the tragedy here. But much as I respect F.B. Mayer, I have to disagree. And the reason I've got to disagree is because Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is 
profitable. And even though it might not be pleasant to read, there's profit for us in this chapter. And the one thing about being committed to verse by verse exposition, and which I am, I think it's very important that we see the word of God in its rightful context. I think it really does make a difference. And so being committed to that, you have to deal with this stuff. As unpleasant as it may be, you have to deal with it. And there are lessons, important lessons we don't want to miss. One of the, the lessons we're going to see here is the incredible parallels between Judges 19 and Genesis 19. Remember, Genesis 19 is where a city or two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, were wiped off the map because of their sin, which became known as sodomy. The actual sin was named after one of those cities. And of course, we're going to see through the Bible, this term sodomite is going to be used over and over again. And so a, a whole city, two cities wiped off the map because of a particular sin. And what we're going to see here is a tribe of Israel is now wanting to commit the very same sin. And this tribe was almost wiped off the map for the same sin. In fact, they were they certainly were greatly radically reduced, weren't they, because of this sin. The difference between the two chapters of Genesis 19 and Judges 19 is this. Sodom had no Bible. The book of the first five books of Moses were known to the people of Israel. In other words, they had the word of God. And so here's the great tragedy. They've got the Pentateuch. They've got divine revelation. And yet they were guilty of the same desires that captivated the hearts of the men of Sodom. Now, once again, we're not chronological sequence here. Uh, because, as we will see in chapter 20, we've got Phinehas, the grandson of Aaron, the priest, is going to be very actively involved in the dealing with the tribe of Dan in this instance. So we're going back to, and, and so we're seeing basically these conditions that we're going to see in Gibeah give us a sense of how bad the book of Judges were. This is early on. This is pretty quickly after the days of Joshua and the elders that outlived Joshua, that conditions got that bad. And when you think about that, it puts people like Samson in a new light, in a sense that for all his failure compared to what conditions were like, he really does stand out as a man of faith, you see. It really kind of gives you perspective here. And as we, we said, the, the previous chapter on idolatry is so related to this chapter. Once God is rejected and replaced, the outcome is inevitable. It is moral corruption. The children of Israel will, will express outrage when they learn of the sin of the men of Gibeah, but they express no outrage about the rival idol that Dan had set up. Isn't that interesting that, that somehow somebody being involved in something as horrific as Genesis 19 uh, somehow causes outrage amongst the people of God. And yet the people of God are not outraged about the idolatry, the spiritual adultery that is taking place. It doesn't affect, cause the same strong feelings as moral corruption does. If only we could understand the grief that idolatry and spiritual adultery brings to the heart of God, it would change our perspective. I believe that the Spirit of God yearns jealously for us to be in love with the Lord Jesus. And when we drift and get involved in idolatry, it breaks the heart. Talk about grieving the Spirit. It grieves him immensely. He wants us to be so in love with that heavenly man and when he sees us playing around with the idols of this world, it grieves him tremendously. Or if somehow we could understand 
what spiritual adultery does to the heart of God. But we we see the moral depravity and we we see all of that very clearly. I want us to go back to Romans 1. I said we're going to see a lot of parallels with Romans 1. And again, I want us to just look for a second to what we we observed about when they exchanged truth, the truth of God, his glory. They made that deliberate exchange. And so it says, verse 23 again, Romans 1, 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Now notice the very next verse, 24, wherefore, in the light of them making this exchange, I'm not going to worship the God who revealed himself, the God uh, whose glory was shown in a sense, in a measure to the children of Israel. His glory dwelt amongst his people. And yet it says, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You see the connection? That's the con connection between chapter 18 and chapter 19. Exchange his glory, worship idols, and the very next thing is God also gave them up to uncleanness. And so we see that very thing taking place in this chapter. Moral corruption is the natural outcome of rejecting the God of revelation. And you see it in our culture, don't you, in our society? What has happened? to canada and the united states what has happened here well i'll tell you what's happened there's been an exchange has been made god has been rejected and the natural outcome of rejecting the god of revelation the god whose glory is revealed particularly to us in the face of jesus christ reject that and what's the natural consequence it is moral depravity of the worst possible kind. So what we're going to look at in this chapter is going to remind us a lot of our culture and our society because it's the natural outcome. It was so bad what happens in this chapter that when we get to verse 30 of this chapter, it's going to tell us this. It was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. In other words, it, it, was, it was so bad, nothing compares to it since they came up out of the land of Egypt. This is how bad this is. This is the worst scenario possible. Now, I just want to look at one other reference before we bring our thoughts to a close i want you to look at the book of hosea 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 is the only uh, other place uh, other than what i believe a strong uh, the very least allusions in romans chapter one but the only other place where this incident in chapter 19 is mentioned is in the book of hosea and he mentions it twice hosea 9 verse 9 it says they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah, therefore he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins. As in the days of Gibeah, you see this, this attempted uh, homosexual rape followed by an actual uh, accomplished uh, gang rape of this woman. It's called the days of Gibeah. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah, chapter 10 and verse 9. He says, O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. So again, Hosea refers back to this. And so how tragic when the people of God, because this is who they are. This is Benjamin. This is the tribe of Benjamin, Gibeah that are going to be guilty here. And yet they're doing the sins of Sodom. And you know what the scripture tells us? It says it's going to be more tolerable on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is that? Well, light. 
light determines the degrees of punishment. And the greater the light rejected, the greater the punishment. To have had the glory of God in your midst and act like Sodom always oh, a very serious thing. And so again, for all of us, <laughs> these are challenging thoughts. Because if our thinking goes astray about who God is, his character, his ways, his glory, you and I are capable of anything, anything. And so we have to make sure that we stay focused, that we behold his glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so to try and rescue this into a more positive ending, can I say this? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And God encourages from this very sobering portion of the word of God and help us to be delivered from even wrong thinking about who God is in his place. We ask it for his glory. Amen.